This is Gary Hartley by the chalkboard. My guest today coming from Alaska is Kate Vay. Kate, welcome. Thank you so much for coming on. <laughs> You're and, welcome. Yeah. Thank you for having me. I'm so excited to be here. Well, I'm excited to have you on. You have some fantastic adventures and stories in life that we're going to talk about today, and I can't wait to hear it from you. Um, for our listener, you and I were... Uh, we graduated together from K High, which is Ketchikan High School in Ketchikan, Alaska, in 1988. And here we are 32 years later, catching up on all the fantastic things that's, that you've been involved with for the last 32 years. Well, and I hope to talk about what you've been involved with, too. We, we can do that. I want to highlight you for, for certain. So we'll start with that. Um, first of all, Let's do a little shout out to our class of 88. So uh, you're welcome to do that and, and mention anybody you want to. Hi, class of 88. I just really enjoyed um, the last reunion. And I think we should get together like rather than 10 years, five years, especially if we all make it through COVID. <laughs> oh, <five. laughs> so, I mean, you know, I, I hope we uh, we're okay and um, thinking of you I just enjoyed the last reunion and yeah I had good feelings that's good I missed that one in in multiple ways missed being able to go up there and missed everybody but it looked like it was fantastic it really was fun yeah I mean we had good weather too um I just I just had such a great time well that's good because Ketchikan had its record rainfall for summer this year and of course, that's that's when I went up. I was up there in August, and it it just rained and rained and rained and rained. So, well, what did you do after you graduated high school? Well, let's see. I I worked for a summer. Um, I was working at the Totem Her Heritage Center. That's right. That's where I was working, and then I went to Fairbanks, um, and. Um, I figured I was going to leave Ketchikan forever at that point. I would never go back. <laughs> and um, so I went to Fairbanks and I really, you know, looking back, I really did not know what I was doing. I just wanted to get off of the rock. I really wanted to leave Ketchikan. I felt very isolated there and like the weather was always rainy and um, it was, um, I just, my feelings of Ketchikan at that point weren't that great. So I, I decided I was gonna leave forever. So I, I went to um, Fairbanks and I had an amazing roommate who got me involved in the sport of running. And I carried that on for a long time. I mean, I just quit when I was like uh, 46 and I switched over to a different sport, which is dancing. And um, I'm trying to think of what else. So I, I went to school and, and then that, that summer I worked in Fairbanks rather than going home and I didn't feel like I could go home. So I, I kept going to, um, to college. And, and then um, th the next summer I didn't, so it was two years. I'm sorry, I feel like I just sort of get boggled when I speak. Um, I'm trying to sort it all out. So it was two years in Fairbanks and then I didn't go home. And then the next year I went to a place called Katmai National Park. I got a job there. Um, I had my room and board paid for. And um, I just sort of thought, well, what the heck? You know, I'm, I'm young, free and single. I may as well just do this. So I worked out there for a summer and I I uh, saw all kinds of bears and um, I hiked through the forest and uh, and then I I did the last thing I did was I hiked through a, a, a volcano called uh, well it was actually not okay so it was like the mouth it was a dome it was a dome so in it's kind of hard to explain but there was a, a big explosion that happened over 100 years ago and it, it transformed the landscape from trees to just a, a wasteland of volcanic ash but instead of actually blowing out of a big mountain it actually blew out of a like a it sort of went to the side the pressure built up and it built it, it blew out of a flat area anyway so i, I hiked that 
actually all by myself. And um, it was uh, just an incredible, um, scary experience, but I, I will never forget it. And then I went to Europe and I, I took a backpack there and I just um, hopped on trains and oh, I actually did a little bit of school in Spain too. Um, I got some college credit for that. And then um, I, I, I just traveled all over the place. I went to Italy, um, Austria, Germany, Spain, France. Where else did I go? And Norway, Sweden. I mean, it was just, I covered every place I could cover. And then um, I met my husband there. Um, and then um, I came back and I, at that point, I, I was tired, you know, um, I said to my parents, I said, can I come home now? It was like two and a half years after I graduated from high school. Now, where, said, where, where, sorry? Where, where did you meet your husband? Uh, Berlin. It's kind of a long story. Um, but well, we knew each other before um, because, but basically we kind of knew each other but we didn't like our uh we we met in in hawaii or when we were little kids our families met and then i went to europe and i um my mom said you know you should really check check this family out if you're gonna go to europe where are you gonna stay for christmas and i said i don't know i mean i'm just gonna at that point i was thinking in my 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 mind that i would like leave the united states forever and never come back I did not want to have anything to do with Ketchikan or Alaska, or I just wanted to like leave, which is kind of immature, <laughs> you know, it's kind of insane. But I just, uh, anyway, so she was kind of concerned about me because I was sort of this, I think it was just like fleeing. I was always fleeing, trying to get away. Um, but my husband, did something um he knew that i was coming and he wrote me a letter and i will never forget the first words of the very first letter he sent to me which were um it is very unusual that i write to you and then he started to explain about all the things that were happening in in berlin germany at the time which was um not even a year out from when the wall fell so it was like he wrote me in January of 90 and the wall had fallen in November of 89. Um, and he was explaining to me all the things that were going on in Berlin, Germany at that time and the, the differences between the East and the West and um, how people were coming together and that he was starting to see a member of his family, members of his family from the Eastern side and how much easier it was to travel from east to west, whereas like only a year before, it would have been impossible for, um, not impossible, but very, very, very tough for him to get from the west into the east. So it was just this fascinating story he was talking about through the whole year he kept writing to me. We wrote to each other about once a month and I loved the way he wrote, even it was, in his second language and the stories he was telling me and the words he used, it was like very fluid and gentle. It was amazing, really. Did you guys get married over there? Uh, we, we got married here, actually in Ketchikan. Okay. And, and then we actually ended up having um, sort of a big celebration over there too. Um, they even roasted a, an, an entire pig for us. <laughs> yeah, different cultures have different uh, experiences with, with wedding ceremonies, don't they? Yeah. So I've been married 26 years, I think. 1994. What is this year? 20? Yeah, 26 years. Wow, excellent. And you have two adopted children. Yeah, we do. Tell us about that. Um, oh, well, okay. So I was thinking, you know, I really thought, no, I can't say this. I feel like, so um, 
you know, when I got out of high school, I never thought I'd get married. I never thought I'd get married. And um, then my husband really wanted to get married. And he kind of said, like he was very direct about it. And I couldn't figure out why he kept hanging out with me and stuff. <laughs> like, you know, I just didn't know. You know, so I just, I never really thought about having kids. But when we got married, then I thought, you know what? I think I'd really like to have kids. So I got married when I was 23. And I really don't know if I was actually really ready to get married, but I did. And, um, but then it kind of added this element into the, um, the, the whole equation that, you know, I could actually, actually have kids. I could actually have a family. And, um, and so I started my job really saving up my money for a baby. And, um, and then I thought, but I'm not ready yet. So I thought, well, age 30, you know, I'll try to figure something out. So I didn't really have the sort of this plan around it. And when I got to age 30, it turned out that we could, we couldn't really do it. So I, um, I went through a lot of medical procedures and, and then um, it was like, man, it was like f five, four years. I don't know. I, I'm just um, trying to figure out how to make this happen. And, and it wasn't, it wasn't working. So then I was at that point, it was like, are you going to be a parent or not? Because if you're going to be a parent, then you can actually pursue this and make it happen. But you have to decide whether or not you're going to do it. And so I really thought about it. And I wasn't, at that point, I was like, I really don't know if I want to do this or not. So we were still going through infertility at the time I was thinking about that. And one of the things I was thought about was how, um, you know, you should really choose to have your child through adoption if you're going to do it. Like you shouldn't be like, oh, I was trying to, you know, like you have to become, you have to be very much at peace with that, that you, you probably won't have a biological child, you know, and, and it's, you know, so you won't be passing your genes on into the world. So you have to be at peace with that. And so, um, I was doing a lot of praying and, um, the thing about going through infertility is that you're like, you kind of get into this really gray zone where you don't know if you're going to have like seven kids all at one time, <laughs> you know, or, you know, you're going to have like a litter or if, if, if you're, you know, you can see kind of the, the way they, they put the, the, you know, the cells together in a petri dish and how that kind of turns out. And sometimes it doesn't turn out right. Or, um, I am, um, I just had, I, I prayed to God that there would be a very clear answer because I was dealing with a lot of ambiguity and um, the, actually the whole process of going through the infertility medical procedures were, um, they were um, kind of almost a little bit, I, almost a little bit like end of life issues. I'd like you the, the the gravity of what I was dealing with at the time was um I don't know it was just I mean I, I guess maybe you don't think about I, I don't know when you have kids you think maybe there's a problem or something arises or how am I going to live with this or whatever but um <clears throat> I prayed to God that I would get a really clear answer and I got a really clear answer and so um, I remember going down to the ocean twice. And the, the first time I went down and I said, okay, well, I know what the answer is and I'm trying to be at peace with it. And I will never have birth kids in my life. And it made me very sad, but I will move on. And then I worked through that. And then I went down to the ocean again and I said to the ocean, I am ready. Bring me the children <laughs> now. I mean, or when you're ready for me, you can bring me these children. And then I um, I had 
a dream about um, a about getting my two kids. It was kind of astounding, and um, I I guess I could talk about it, but it's such a weird thing. <laughs> You know? It's it's not to me. I've kept a dream journal since 2008. So I, I understand having dreams and having knowing that there's meaning there. If you want to share that, okay, that's up to you. But I get it. Okay, so I feel like I will try to explain this. But I also have, <clears throat> I tend to kind of stumble over my words a little bit. So I hope that you will be okay with that. Um, I'm trying to get, I know what it looks like in my head. I'm just trying to get it out on words. So um, the dream was that I was in a, a husband with my boat. I mean, I was in a boat with my husband and we were, it was just the two of us. And um, we were out on the sea and there was a big storm that picked up and we were being tossed out on the ocean but the waves were enormous like the boat was just very tiny but the waves were like you know 20 times the size of the boat so we were like this little tiny boat in these swells and my husband said you need to get down to the bottom of the boat because that will if you have your weight out of at the bottom of the boat then we will not topple over so i went down to the bottom of the boat and I laid down and I fell asleep, but I, I had this feeling of a presence of another being inside of this boat. I didn't know who it was. And then um, I woke up and the seas were calm and in the distance I could see a very old shining city. And then all of a sudden we were in this city <clears throat> and we were <clears throat> in a, you know, it was almost like one of those, uh, you know, you see in third world countries, the guys who are biking and, and there's a trailer in the back with like a couple or something. We were in one of those <laughs> and we were going somewhere. Um, and still there was this presence of this being along with us. And then we were, um, we went to this arena and there were like the, there was this huge stairwell we had to climb up. It was just this enormous, enormous stairwell. So we climbed up the stairwell, and we got to the top, and we entered into the arena. And we looked down, and it was like this big soccer field. And then all of a sudden, we were in the soccer field. And then the lights went on. And you know, if you're inside of an arena at night, you know that those not those lights are very bright and very hot and i could feel in my dream the heat from the lights on my face it, it was warming me up and then um all of a sudden there were um these two boys and they were dark boys they did not look like us you know and um, and everybody started to cheer in the stadium. And I, I mean, I just remember that I could hear this, this voice that said, this is your family. And that it was like, not from a uh, person that was saying it was just this 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 person or this 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 kind of spirit presence that said this is your family and and i remember just like getting down on the ground and just hugging them but they um i did not even see that there were other people around at that point I could only see my children and my husband that was all I could see just this this unit like the four of us inside of the soccer stadium and I had this feeling in my dream that these children would be friends their whole lives that they would not that they this this would be a good 
sibling union. Like it would be very good. And then I woke up and there were tears streaming down my eyes. And that morning I, I filled out the paperwork to get a child because my husband had done it and he was waiting for me and I just did it. I, I had to fill out a lot of paperwork and we had to, you know, we had to pay a lot of bills <laughs> to get these kids. So, um, but then the funny thing about this dream was that when we went over to Korea um, to get these kids, um, I made a friend over there who, uh, she was going to have a baby. It was really funny. I met her at this um, park and she was married and she, they were going to have their first baby. And we said, okay, we're getting our first baby too. And she had talked about how um, she knew she was pregnant because she had the baby dream. And I said, I think I have the baby dream too. But it, it was two boys and they kind of looked like each other and they were dark, you know? And so I, that was it, you know, that was how I was going to get my family. Yeah. How did you end up choosing or uh, Korea for that? How did that come about? Um, the, well, we were in the age bracket. I wasn't, I did not feel comfortable like um, being in an open adoption. So an open adoption is where you um, have contact with the birth parents. And that seemed to be the way it was being done in the United States at the point. We wanted to get really young kids. I, I, wanted, I wanted to have the baby experience. So that was really important to me because I have, you know, always loved babies, you know, I mean, who doesn't, you know? Um, so I, I didn't feel like I was really up to um, adopting an older child, but I think, I think, I, I know people who have done it, it's worked out really super well for them. Um, but uh, Korea did, they did, instead of doing um, orphanages, they did uh, foster care. So the kids aren't having such attachment issues. Um, and it was really those things. That, um, yeah, that was it. Okay. And how long ago was that when you got them? Yeah, so that was, let's see, Ben is 15 and Nick is 12. No, he's 13 now. So 15, 13 years ago. Yeah. Okay. And it was so much fun going over to Korea to get them. I mean, I just love that part. Um, it was like, um, you know, um, landing in the airport. I don't know. It's, I mean, the whole, and I, it's funny that you're, you're really, Paul, you're really stretching my brain because I don't really think about these things too much. I'll stick with the subject though, because I tend to go on tangents. Where was I? Okay, going into Korea, flying into Korea. When we got in there, so we had to go through Japan. No, we went through Seattle first. And then like a little bit closer, we're a little bit closer, going, flying into Japan. Oh, wow, you know, here we are in Japan. I've never been to Japan. Flying through the Tokyo airport. This is really cool, love this. And then flying into Korea and they've got this massive airport in Incheon which is um, the big Seoul airport. Like Seoul is like, it's like New York City. It's just enormous and huge and very cosmopolitan. And there's so many people. And at the first thing I thought was, I am breathing the same air as my child. And the second thought was, there are so many people here. I mean, there's like, you know, you, you get into Ted Stevens National Airport and you, you know, you fly over the pole over to Frankfurt and you get off of the plane and you get really overwhelmed by just the vast amounts of people. Um, I mean, I can't believe how many humans are on the planet. I mean, <laughs> I don't even realize it until I leave the state, but going back to Korea. So I felt, so, you know, I felt actually okay taking a human being out of that country. Um, because they had so many humans in that country. Um, 
and uh, I, I I thought it was okay that you know I felt kind of bad that I was taking this child out of his birth land and I would never really be able to um, you know make that up I would you know I couldn't I could never give him Korea back and I thought Korea was a pretty amazing place um, but you know we walked into the um, adoption agency which is Holt that's a big adoption agency worldwide and with I remember the first time I saw both of my kids and the first time I saw Ben he was actually on his foster mom's back because they carry these kids around and put eggies, which are these things you put on your back and they wrap the kids around they they do this a lot in other countries um here in the United States they do a lot of car seating um so the kids are like carried around on their car seats everywhere but over there the the kids are like from a very young age this little tiny infants and they're, they're just sort of flopping around they they stick them on their backs <laughs> and then what i realized is that their neck muscles really develop because they they get their head up and they look around so they um but anyway i remember when i first saw ben he was on his foster mom's back and he had these big ears they like stuck out like flying ears you know like prince charles ears and um and I looked at the back of him and I thought, wow, the ears, you know, look at that kid. And then when um, they said, that's your baby, I looked at him and I thought, holy smokes, this is one handsome devil. And um, and then um, with, with Nick, the first time I saw him, I was like, my breath was just taken away because he was such a beautiful baby. He had the most beautiful set of lips, like very full lips and these amazing, like these eyes that are like, they're, they're almond, but they're, they're just, they're kind of, I don't know. They're just, I don't know. Like as a baby, he was just incredible. I mean, they were both really beautiful babies. Yeah. No, so, we're going through adolescence. So. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah, I have two I have two teenage daughters, so that's that's really fun. Yeah. So did you you did you adopt one and then go back again yeah. several years later? Adopt the and they're one? not they're not related to each other, like in a bloodline. Yeah. Okay. But we, three years later. So we we went and I mean we're like by the time I got my first kid, I was 35. And I was kind of like, well, I really want to get the second kid before I'm 40. <laughs> so once we, Korea makes you wait before you have this, apply for the second child. So we, the soonest we could get Nick was about three years later. And then I was like, Ugh. by that time, then I, if we had to, I, we could have done it again, but it would have been like really close to 40 at the cutoff. Uh, and I was like, I'm tired, you know, I got to move on. <laughs> I loved having kids. I love the adoption experience. I thought it was really cool. Um, adolescence is ew, a struggle, but we're making it. When, when you had that dream, was that unusual to have a dream that, that you knew had that much meaning to it? Yes. Very unusual. So you knew there's something so important about this. Yeah, that... and you know, I tell you what, Gary, um, I've always been kind of like, get, like, you know, I was saying I, I wanted to get away from catching him and I, I, I felt like I was running away from things my whole life. And I was also a little bit, brain, you know, I couldn't really focus on anything. And I was always doubting myself. Am I in the right profession? Am I like speaking the right way? Am I using the right words? How am I interacting with this person? I just don't know. And this has been sort of this dominant factor in my life. But the dream made me realize that I needed to do this. Um, and so it 
it was really useful because I had people telling me, are you sure you really want to do this? And I'm like, yes, I'm sure. And I couldn't really say why, you know, <laughs> because I've got this really crazy dream, but I had it and I held on to it because I felt like there was something within me that if I didn't have the chance to have kids, um, or I, it would be a huge regret for me. Um, I would take it to my grave, even like I, I never got to have kids. And this is something that would really, really bother me. And I had, so I had this, this maternal instinct that would not shut up, even though like biologically could not do it. So um, yeah, that was really powerful within me. Yeah. That's really cool. And I love the part of your dream where you're standing in the stadium with those two boys in the stadiums cheering. I love that. I do too. I really love that. Yeah. Yeah. And I, you know, I told my kids about the dream and I'm like, yeah, I mean, I probably, sh I should probably write it down because that is like a part of our family legacy, you know, is that I had this kind of vision, you know, so that, that this, this was too, I mean, this was supposed to happen in my life. And I kind of feel like, gee, you know, I mean, I kind of feel like maybe God tells you things, but like, maybe he changes his mind or whatever. Maybe he doesn't, he's like, okay, I told you this, but I can change my mind because I am God and I'm all powerful. I, I just, to me, it's sort of like, yeah. So there's a, an element where you have to let go because maybe the plan isn't that. I mean, you like every day you wake up and I'm like, okay, you know, I submit an application. I just don't know. So then you're like, well, you know, but maybe there isn't a child. I mean, who knows? But you kind of just, <laughs> it's sort of like when you, you you cross the Red Sea in this 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 leap of faith. Is It's not really, I mean, there are certain points where there is a leap of faith, but mostly, it's just that I think the water parts a little bit and then you, you step in where it's dry and then the water parts a little bit more and then you step in where it's dry and then maybe it parts about 20 feet and then you go over, you know, um, so that's the way I see it. Now, that is a cool experience. I'm really glad that you had that. Dreams are a really important part of my life. So fantastic. So with all this uh, you, you were talking about doubting what you were doing when you were younger and what you were saying and how people were thinking about it. And yet somehow in your life, you got this, what, what I'm looking at is extreme confidence when you were 46, when you ran for uh, Miss Alaska. Yeah. I don't know. How did that happen? <laughs> I want so that know. was also, I mean, I didn't have any dreams about that. But what I had was this sense of, um, okay, so let me back up. I'm so excited to be in your podcast. I've never been on a podcast before. I just want to tell you that. And it's so funny that you're asking me these questions about, you know, my life and that somebody actually wants to hear these things. What was the question again? Was, I want to know about you running for uh, Miss Alaska beauty pageant when you were 46 years old. Yeah. So, okay. So um, I felt like when I had my babies, like this was the place where I was called to be. Like it was so natural for me to be like changing diapers and feeding them and, you know, just holding them for hours, you know, and looking into their eyes like this, you know, it was like, to me, this was so natural for me to be bonding on this level. but as all, you know, kids do, <laughs> they grew up. Oh. <laughs> so I'm much more like of a baby person and not really like adolescence. Ah, oh, this is awful. I'm just barely making it through this stage, <laughs> but I'm hanging in there. But basically my kids got to elementary school and they did well. I mean, they did really well. And I was kind of left behind. <laughs> so I was thinking about, well, I, I know I'm not going to have another baby because I just, you know, it's resources and things. And I just, you know, I have to like move on to something. So I was like trying to figure out, well, what am I going to do? 
And I thought, well, I read a book actually about it. And it was this book about, gee, what was it called? It was a book about a girl who was kind of overweight and she, she ran in a beauty pageant. And her, see, her, mother, her mother was really into beauty pageants. And she, um, she never felt like, you know, she was like the, the real beautiful one, you know, <laughs> sort of like, and it was kind of this exploration of like, you know, internal beauty and stuff. And I thought, I thought, you know, this is a really interesting way of looking at things. And when I was younger, I never felt like I was like the, the beautiful one in high school. I was, I felt kind of invisible. Like, um, I, like, <laughs> like I had to like almost tie a king salmon around my neck to get the guys to look at me. You know, I just, I, I, and it was also that in Catch Can, it was very difficult to run in any kind of a pageant because you'd have to like get in an airplane and go there. So I was living in Soldatna and I thought, you know what, I could probably just <clears throat> drive up for all the interviews and the practices. And if I looked at it like just as a way of uh, improving myself, I think I'll win. If I go after the crown, I think I'm going to be totally miserable. And um, so I, I had that attitude, like, I'm just gonna just improve myself. This is something that's offered to all married ladies, regardless of your age, actually. It really was funny. Like you can be 65 and, and do it. And I thought, well, you know, I'm just gonna try this, you know, and see. But the other thing was that um, I also was running into some health issues. Like I, I can't get into high heels anymore because the bones in my feet have been, um, they've they're not right anymore you know i have to have surgery um and i was like i could i i can't do really high pumps but i can do a high heels for a limited amount of time so i will just give it a shot and so i i got a dress all i really needed was i needed three dresses or three outfits i needed a bathing suit um, a red dress and a and a um a formal gown and I got, a, I got a formal gown. I had taken off 25 pounds because of baby weight, believe it or not. <laughs> and so I could get into a swimming suit and I could get into clothes. And I thought, well, you know, this is like, it's, it's going to help me improve myself. And it, and it did like, um, I, as you can tell, I have kind of a hard time was speaking a little bit and so it it really helped me to um get the the, the ideas that were in my head out into the world <laughs> um and um I, so the interviewing i had to go through a lot of interviewing practice and that was really really good for me and then <clears throat> What else? It was just all around really good. I had to, oh, the other, the other thing that was really interesting was um, breaking bad habits. And one of the things that I had done in my life, and I didn't notice it, I had done it unconsciously, but I self-doubted a lot. I spoke down to myself inside of my head. Mm -hmm. And I realized if I was going to get up in front of a group of people in a bathing suit, I was going to have to really pump myself up. So I ended up having to um, say to myself, you are the most spectacular woman on the face of this planet. <laughs> and if you have a doubt, you have to squash it now, because if you get on that stage, you will not survive in a bathing suit. And so I, it takes about three months um, to, of doing that before you can get beyond that. So, you know, you say like the habit, whether it's smoking or whatever. So that was kind of my habit. Um, if you get through three months, you have formed a new habit, which is the opposite of self-doubt, which is like, geez, I'm a smashing woman. You know, so it's confidence. So you get confidence. Um, yeah. Now, since you were 46, were there any women competing who were close to your age? 
the one was, yeah, the other one was 40, six years younger. Yeah. And she actually went on to win it a couple years later. Okay. Yeah. Um, but um, most of the people are like in their 20s and early 30s. But but the thing is with the Mrs. pageant, it's different than the Miss because, oh, you know, we had a lady who was pregnant while she was <laughs> running in a bathing suit. I'm like, wow, you know? So, and they seem like they've dealt with kids. They've dealt with husbands, you know, they seem a little bit more down to earth. Um, and actually running in a pageant for them is, is really special. I never did the Miss uh, America, Alaska. I never did that. I think that would have, I don't know if that would have been such a good thing for me. But running in the Misses was good. And then I found out that there's a lot of different pageants out there. There's like, um, if you go on, you can do Senior America. And my kids are like, yeah, you should do that, mom. You get it, you know? <laughs> <laughs> so I'd be like the youngest of the old pageant. Instead, I was the oldest of the young pageants. <laughs> nice. I think, I think the most important thing to me, what I heard you say is that you weren't competing for the crown. You were doing this to better yourself. And if you had been competing for the crown, you would have been disappointed. But because you were going in there to better yourself, how can you not succeed at that? And I think that's fabulous. I think that's the message that people need to hear, especially women need to hear that it's not about you getting the trophy. You're the trophy. Yeah, right. Yeah, that was it. Exactly. That's what I found out. I am the trophy. And I, well, you know, so I'm always wearing the crown, you know, no matter where I go. I was Mrs. Soldatin at one point, you know, so that's, you know, woo, you know, I, that's kind of a feather in my cap. <laughs> No, I love it. I love that story. That's why I had to have you on here. And I said, oh, I got to hear this story and other people do. So I saw a video of you not long ago. In fact, a lot of people saw a video of you and uh, of you belly dancing. How did you yeah. get into that? Huh? Yeah. So a lot of things happened all at once, like in the last five years when my kids were like, you know, kind of getting independent. And then I was sort of at like a job loss almost, you know, you're just trying to figure out what to do next. And the thing about my life is that I never felt like I really fit in high school. I never really felt like I figured out what I wanted to do vocationally. It was just, for me, it was always just kind of a job, you know, I needed to go there to get paid. But the one thing I, I knew it was possible to get into a vocation where you feel like you're doing like God's work. And that was because um, I had adopted my kids and I felt like, you know, I was providing a home, medical care, uh, food, shelter, um, an emotional, an emotionally um, in tune mother. Um, I felt like I was modeling a marriage that was sustainable you know, I felt like I was doing a lot of really good things for these kids. I felt like I was there for God's calling. I really felt like that. And I felt it inside. Like I was very motivated to do this job. I loved it. I felt like, but you know, you can't keep your kids like, you know, if you have to like let them go, you know, into the world and to explore and to try things. And um. So I was kind of at a loss and I felt like I said to God, you know, I could go back to work and, um, and I actually did eventually, you know, um, but, um, I, I really want that feeling. I want to do something that is going to be good. Like just your calling. I don't know what that is. And I don't feel like I've ever fit in anywhere. I don't know what I'm doing or where I'm going. And I said, you know what? I give up. I give up because I cannot do this. I cannot make these decisions for myself. I have no idea. You are the person or the, the being that really has my welfare in your hands. And I want you to take my life and I want you to mold me like clay and to make me whatever you want me to be in this world. 
because I am tired of like taking the reins in this. I have no idea. Just take over for me. And so I kind of left it there. And then I was going through life and I like to watch a lot of TED Talks. And there was like a whole, so that was one of the things. It was like, I was kind of letting the job of, of early childhood mothering go, trying to get an identity, <clears throat> trying to figure out how I was gonna get back into the world after that. <clears throat> and, and then I was also really searching for my own femininity because my experience in high school was competition and I felt like I never really liked competitive sports. That was just not for me. I was like more of a cooperative, connective person. Um, but it didn't seem like I could connect with really anybody in high school or I don't know, it was just sort of like, you need to get a career and move on. And like, it, you know, can you imagine in the eighties where like the whole idea was like, you know, go to wall street and make all this money. So like really dominate, but I'm not really this dominant person. I am, I just, I, you know, my thing was nurturing, you know, <laughs> you know, that was, I loved watching my babies grow. That was like, and I love to, you know, grow a garden and like nurture the seeds and water the plants and see how they are as like, you know, springtime when they just start budding out of the ground and you're just picking out the weeds around them and <clears throat> trying to get the seeds to grow. I mean, that was my thing. It wasn't like going off and being competitive and shooting people down. That was not my thing. And I know what that looks like because I have boys and <laughs> I've seen that in, in my boys. They're like, especially one of them is very like masculine and he wants to, you know, go off and hunt and, you know, you know, that's just not my thing. So I, I was searching for femininity. I was searching for strength in femininity and I really wanted to know what the female version of strength looked like and I you know compared to the masculine virgin version because I felt like I had taken the pill like I, a long time ago well you must succeed and all this stuff but I never felt like I was really succeeding in every anything except motherhood. I, I felt like I, I, you know, was, I love that, you know, and my kids, you know, I rescued them from you know, drowning and I was just good at, I was good at watching babies, really good at that. Um, but, um, I was, I like to watch Ted talks and I was watching this, this talk. It was about, um, belly dancing and um the the speaker was Kaothar Darmoni I think was what her name is but she was this beautiful woman um on the TED talk and she was always moving like moving her body and she talked about she never stopped through her whole speech she's always doing these these movements and um she had talked about how she had grown up in Tunisia and in a very Muslim country and they were covered, the women were covered. And she was like, I hate this. I'm getting out of here. This is very repressive for me. So it spoke to me because when I was in Ketchikan, I felt like I need to get away from here. I need to run away from this. And it was sort of the same story. Like she was trying to run away from that. And then she went to uh, the Western, I think it was Holland or something. And she was really, she went there to explore like uh, feminine feminism in the Western society. And when she got done with it, she felt really exhausted. <laughs> like, like she felt like Westernized women were just as repressed as Middle Eastern women. I'm sorry to say that. And I, when she said that, I felt the same way. Hmm. Like I have been repressed. 
And, um, and it was sort of a come to Jesus moment for me. And, you know, I'm actually, I feel like I, I keep talking about God and everything, but actually I have to say that I'm actually a Democrat. <laughs> I'm not, I'm not like a conservative. I'm not one of the, I don't go to a conservative Bible church. I'm actually, I actually converted over to Lutheranism um, because it was a little bit more freeing than the Catholic church. Like I felt like women in the Catholic church were, we could never really get ahead or, you know, they were just kind of, we could be nuns, but that was it, you know? Um, I just saw more opportunity. And I felt like I was also deeply spiritual. Like there could have been, I don't know, it was just, it was better for me. But, um, but I felt like my feminist femininity was really, as an Alaskan woman, I felt kind of beat up. And I, like, um, I mean, you know, the Me Too movement, like I never stated what my Me Too was, but I have dealt with job harassment and um, I, you know, and it just, I was cornered by a guy every day who just told me how awful I was, you know, and um, it really hurt me and it made me so angry. And um, I felt very repressed. And then I had, I had seen, I grew up in Alaska. I had seen women get murdered and beat up and I, really needed a role model. How do I get out of this? You know, I don't want to get beat up. I don't want to get put down. I don't want to get harassed on the job. Once I get a job, I want to be paid well. You know, if I have, you know, I just, just, it was just all kinds of, of things. Like I just felt repressed, like, <clears throat> you know, here are the standards and you can't walk past that line, but there has to be a way that you and I can connect where I'm not getting <clears throat> hurt. You cannot hurt me, but not all guys do that either. It's just the ones where you have to say, look, you can't do that to me. This hurts me so badly. It takes my life out of me. Do you want to do that? Do you really want to do that? And I was looking for that voice, that honest voice where I could be assertive, but not like I could, like I was not like pushed over because I felt like a lot of my life was me trying to say something I could not say because I could not get it out of my head into the world. I did not know how to do that. But with belly dancing, I could do it through my body. and. I didn't have to depend on the speech. Hmm. So what you're actually doing for me is you're listening to me when I go out and I converse with people because it takes me a while to gather my thoughts and formulate them and, and get them out into the world. Um, I keep forgetting. Um, I get passed over a lot in conversation because they won't listen or they don't have the time to listen. But when I spoke with my body, then I got people's attention. But I didn't just get their attention. I got my own attention and my own power. And I felt like belly dancing taught me how to be honest and loyal and kind of a vixen and to have confidence because anytime you move a part of your body it means something you're speaking to the world and i in the mrs alaska pageant i found out something from one of my teachers which was um that uh th think she said about 99 percent of what you say is through your body it's not through what you, you say, 
So people will not remember what you speak, but they will remember how you physically appear to them. But it's um, like when you look into belly dancing, it's kind of a bit like a martial art, but it's got this really cool feminine aspect of it where you're just building up your femininity. And now before I go any further, I have to say this because we live in an era where, you know, we have marriage equality and, and like transgender issues and all of this. What I'm gonna tell you is that um, I feel like within each person, there is a yin and a yang. So the yin is like the feminine side and the yang is the masculine side. I'm not saying this is true. It's just my own personal philosophy. But I think within certain males, they have more of a yin side and certain males are more of a, a yang side. So the very, very, uh, you know, um, manly men, you know, they've got a lot of the yang and then men who are not quite like that, more of the gentler side. But also in women, you have the same thing. And, I, you know, women who are very, very career oriented, goal driven, all of these things. And they maybe they're, I guess, more masculine. I, I think, you know, and then you have women who are very nurturing and quiet and, you know, but I was kind of more of this quiet, shy type. It, I was growing up at, at a time when everybody was supposed to be masculine and I was not, you know? So I was like, I really have to be me. But the thing is with belly dancing is that, which is so cool is that you actually, there's a lot of trans, transgen, transgender women, like masculine to feminine transition who will get into this art because they're, they haven't had the permission to do that. So they get into belly dancing and it helps them find their feminine side, you know, and to be more present. So I think it's the way you are is really fine. You just have to figure out where you're, you're supposed to be, you know? And so like belly dancing for me was like this way of like being. And um, I took it to my preschool and I showed it to the kids. And it was so fascinating to me because I had one boy who crawled under a table. He was like, I'm not having anything to do with this. <laughs> and then I had two girls who were really interested. And then I had this little boy who was like, oh my gosh, I love this belly dancing. And he was like really into it. And I'm thinking, well, why not? You know, I mean, if it builds his confidence and why not? Because there's like, if you look at a man dancing, if they really know what they're doing, it's like watching a stallion. I love to watch men dance, it, really good dancers, you know? They're so much better than women, but there's so many more women who dance than men. But if you see a guy who's really a good professional dancer, he looks like a stallion to me. It's just like his body is, he just knows what he's doing and he knows where he's taking the dance. Um, but yeah, anyway, so going back into the body, the, the, um, the dance is like martial arts. It, it helps you to really listen to your body and listen to, if I eat this, it doesn't feel so good. You know, I, if I move this way, it doesn't feel so good So stop, you know, so it teaches me my limitations. And then it also teaches me, um, like if I move my hips, I'm, I'm looking at my resources. If I move my tummy, I'm looking at my emotions. If I move my chest, I'm looking at my business side, how am I taking care of myself? If I look at what I'm doing with my head, that's, that's my divine calling. So I, every time I do a, a movement, I'm thinking about um, how I'm living my life. And, and then the hands are like how you handle the world around you and how you, I don't know. So yeah, that's it. Wow. I, I 
I'm going to have to go back and listen to the last 10 minutes. Cause I can't, I'm, I'm that, that was, that was Kate. Okay, that was so profound. Oh, really? Yes, really. I'm, I'm mesmerized by I'm, I'm so excited to share that. I'm going to take a, probably a short clip of just that. And I'm also want to make sure anybody listening and watching this, the links to Kate's like her, one of her belly dancing videos she posted on Facebook and a link to her, the website where the other women are belly dancing in her group and how they started. Uh, that's going to be down below. It's, it's really interesting to go look at and read that information. It's very well done. And uh, I know when you shared that, that belly dancing video on Facebook, what a week ago, it wasn't too long ago. Um, yeah. It, everybody who saw it was going, wow, that's Kate. And she's, you know, she's 50 years old and she's belly dancing and, and she's fabulous. And I showed it to people just here in Abilene, Texas, where I, I was at a cigar shop with some friends. And I said, look at this girl. I graduated with her and they're going, wow, that's really good. That's fascinating. It was fantastic. I well, loved which, it. Which, which one was it? Was it the one in front of the boat? No, the one I saw was in, uh, it looked like it may be in a living room in a house. Oh, that was, that was a long time ago. I've gotten a lot better since then. And so the one, what, yeah. So the one you just sent me, I hadn't, I didn't see that one. Cause I was looking at the website. Is that the mo more recent one? I, I made you a belly gram video. Okay. I'm so yeah. A belly gram is when you go to somebody's party and you shed your clothing and you belly dance. Okay. <laughs> I, I had not seen that one. Okay. I got, I do have the link here, but I'm going to post that. And so everyone else can see it. And uh, I'll make sure that one gets goes out. Everyone, you got to watch it because I know it's going to be fantastic. Yeah. 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 I mean, it, being so shy, I kind of have a little bit of the exhibitionist within me, you know. <laughs> wow. <laughs> Kate, I, I am. I can't tell you how I, you have really. I'm trying to find words here. Um, you've really moved me today, just your description and your passion and, and being so honest and real with experiences in your life is it's got to be so encouraging to so many people because I'm, I'm moved by it. I'm really oh. moved by your conversation and you describing these wonderful things in your life and, and uh, how they had so much value to you. And you, you put, you put a, just a profound description on belly dancing. I, I was, I'm, I'm half speechless. I've got today after we're done with this, I'm going to go back and listen to it. Cause I, there was so much information in there that I, I have to just soak it in again. Yeah. Yeah. Whatever. You know, it took a while for me to kind of sort it out in my head too. And, and even my body. So like I, when I first, the thing is, when I first started, you know, I, I went from running to dancing and I was really like, I really want to go into this. Like I really want to get there. And um, so I pushed my body and I ended up like um, hurting myself. <laughs> so then I couldn't dance for like two weeks. And so I was like, okay, that's the lesson that I, I really have to, um, it's sort of, geez, there's so many lessons in belly dancing. I'm still not done learning them all. And it's funny because um, I just before COVID hit, I was about ready to take my show on the road, you know? <laughs> like I was gonna go down to the public library and teach it to all the little kids in town, <laughs> you know? <laughs> um, but then we all got locked in our houses. So I, we, it's just basically two of us. Um, we were uh, meeting through the summer outside right next to the Kenai River. <clears throat> and now we, we are like in masks <laughs> and we're, we're staying apart and we are like, we go outside a little bit and do it and we film ourselves and we come in. So we're kind of going through this thing where we're, we're filming ourselves and I'm learning a lot about editing. <clears throat> and I don't know, it's just, it's a hobby really, but it's also like, I will, like, I, I think it's just, it's martial arts. Like, um, it, like you, you start that and you, you realize it's a, it's a lifestyle. Um, so that's my, my clan right there. Um, my sisterhood really. And in, on the Kenai, 
there's not a lot of women who do it. <laughs> so even if like <clears throat> you do it alone, like it's such a versatile dance. You can do it alone or you can do it in a group or you can do it with a partner or whatever. So yeah, there's just a lot of flexibility. I like that. Wow. I got to ask you one more thing here. And well, I want to make sure you have time because we scheduled an hour, but you, you can continue to talk as long as you want here. Um, you talked about harassing the local officials. In fact, on the on the belly dancing website that, that I have posted here, it, it, you even mentioned that all of you harassed the local officials. So tell me about that. Well, no, I mean, we didn't all at once. I, it's, I've always been quite politically active. And I really do enjoy harassing politicians because I think they're so full of themselves. And I think we kind of have to have a little bit of fun with these people. Mm -hmm. But the thing is, is that we do live in a really amazing country where we we can like say, well, I mean, you should, I don't, okay, so I will say this. I don't think you should go there and harass people just to harass people. Right. But, but you know, you, you have an issue and you're like, okay, well, you know, why are you doing that? You know, I mean, because I think sometimes they have to, they kind of need to be brought down a little bit from the pedestal. And so I, I will, I always try to say thank you for, you know, your service, because I don't think it's an easy gig. I really don't. Um, and this is what I, I, think of this. And then um, thanks again for your service and taking the time to listen to me, bitch and moan. Oh, I just said the bad, bad word. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> I just cussed. You can bleep that out. No, no, this is freedom of speech. You know, it's an open <laughs> microphone. There's no editing here. But I just really, I take advantage of the fact that I have local officials and they know who I am. And I did, um, run a couple of times. I ran for a local electric company, which I really would have enjoyed. I think I really would have enjoyed that job, but I lost. Um, and I was like really excited because I ran, I lost by like 33%. <laughs> like, so it was a terrible, you know, um, but I was like, wow, it wasn't that bad. You know, usually people are losing like by 25% on the democratic side because I'm a, I'm a blue in a really heavily red area. Um, but uh, so, but, and then um, the, the thing was in the electric company, someone, one of the voters called me and he said, he gave me the story. It was so full of BS. It was basically, he was just on and on and on and on and on and about how he, he didn't pay his, it essentially didn't pay his bills. So the electric company was going to cut him off. And I kept saying, well, he said, well, they're on my property. They're on my property. I said, well, did you pay your bill? Did you pay your bill? But I mean, he wouldn't answer the question. So I'm like, okay, of course he didn't pay his bill. That's why they're on his, on his property. So I ended up saying to them, look, if you didn't pay your bill, they're going to come out and shut you off. And you know what? That I'm gonna be like that on the board. And if you don't like that, you should vote for the other guy. <laughs> so I mean, I'm really not a politician like trying to get all these votes. I'm like, just vote for the other guy. And then the the um, the other one I ran for was um, the borough assembly, and um, I kind of got snagged into that. Oh, it was a really poor decision on my part, but I ended up dropping out of the race because of all kinds of circumstances. And I just sort of crawled into a, a hole and I said, oh, how can I make myself disappear? You know, I really don't want to be in this election. I, and I was trying, I tried to get my name off of the ballot, but the ballots had been printed. So my name was like on the ballot. And I realized at that point I needed to like, you know, really rethink my life. And uh, how, why was I making these poor choices? Um, but it was, it was just, I just have, yeah, I, I won't say I'll never run again, but I just, I'm really much more comfortable in the harassment, you know, like on the harassing side. <laughs> <laughs> but I have to say this, you know, it's, it's really important that we vote that we're, we're active because 
democracy is not a spectator sport, that this is a sign of a healthy democracy even now where we're so divided. I think it's almost healthier now because we're all thinking, we're all participating when we're all like lax and we're like, okay, everybody's taking care of it for us. That's when things go haywire. And right now, I think it's really good. I don't think people really see how good it is to be on um, you know, opposing sides, almost even to the point where you can't speak to each other. It just all, it, it really means that you just care. It just means that you care, but we really don't know how to speak each other's language. Yeah, those relationships are really important. And I, I value human life over any ideology. I want, I want to know my neighbors that live around me and value them as, as human beings and have conversations like this, regardless of what political stance they take. And when you start, when you come from that standpoint and just have a conversation and value them as life, regardless of what they believe, oh, it just builds up a wonderful um, opportunities for you to get to know people and have friends and regardless of what you believe. Yeah, I totally agree with that. So I always come from that. So when you say harass, what you really mean is uh, political uh, officials. You really mean ask hard questions. That's really what you're saying, isn't it? <laughs> yes. Ask the hard questions. Yeah. Yeah. And, and there's some, a lot of hard questions to ask right now. Yeah. So, yeah, because harassment often is taken as a negative thing, but sometimes political officials, they you got to kind of wake them up a little bit by getting direct and to the point I'm like okay look we're looking at this today sir or ma'am <laughs> i mean that's that's why they have staff too because it kind of buffers the the message i know you know they get a lot of and i've been to like a lot of council meetings or there's a lot of contentious issues and people are full of emotions or whatever um it's kind of a matter of trying to take the emotion down. What do you call that when you, when you cool things down? What is that? You de-escalate. De-escalate. That's kind of what we need, but we do need dialogue. I mean, there's a lot of things. Um, yeah. Hmm. Okay. Let's one more thing. I want to, I want to, ask you one more thing because you've talked about it several times how important your spiritual life is to you um i'd like you to add i don't know just one more thing about your spiritual life and why and why that's important and why prayer is important to you oh boy um because i feel like i've kind of been going through a a dry spell um Okay, so when I was going through this whole search for femininity, um, I mean, the, so the spiritual route is so personal, so different for everybody. But for me, it gave me a sense of grounding where I felt like if things were hard, I would run. If I couldn't deal with a person, I would run away. And I felt like, or if I couldn't do a job, I would run away. And spirituality said to me, I created you in a garden. As a woman, I created you in a garden. I did not create a man in a garden. I mean, if you if you go back to the the reading of Eden, they say that the man was created first, but he was put into the Garden of Eden. But Eve was created inside of the garden, hmm. and so she is already part of the land. She is the land, like la tierra. La tierra in Spanish means land, and it's feminine. So. The garden is my spirituality. I go back to the garden and God is in the garden. 
so if I am confused or running, I don't have to run because I already have the garden inside of me. <clears throat> I just go back to God in the garden every time. And I say, what am I supposed to do here? I am so confused. And I know that God speaks to me through the, the, um, the reality, the real part of my life. Okay, so there's like a spiritual side where that's more of a, I guess, internal. So the external part, I know that God is speaking to me and you have to listen to him. What is he saying? How, what is my intuition saying? How am I going to figure this out? And how is God going to guide me? But there is always the garden. I didn't know this my, most of my life. I was running away from different things because I was looking for the garden, but the garden is just here. It's within me. And God is in the garden. And that is really it. That is it. It's so simple. You run all over the place. You run so far that your feet need surgery because you're running, you're stomping the entire earth, looking for everything everywhere. You're going to a volcano because you don't feel like you can go back to your hometown. You're going to Europe because you're thinking you're going to leave your country. I mean, it gets to the point of like exhaustion where you're like, I cannot run anymore. And so God takes you back to the garden as a woman. And that is where I found my power. Wow. That was awesome. That was awesome. That was awesome. Wow. <laughs> All right. Well, Kate, I'm going to, I'm going to wrap this up here and I am so glad to touch base with you. I'm so thankful you came on my show. It was so inspiring to hear you talk and, and share aspects of your life. And I'm, I'm just, it just, I'm so happy that you have this happiness in your life. Oh, I am too. And thank you. I, I really wanted to stay and ask you questions about your life. You know what, we can do another one sometime if you if you would like to do that. So my 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 objective today was to give you the microphone so you could talk about your life and people could follow up on what's been happening with you. And we did that in I I think a pretty spectacular way. So well we can do another one sometime if you want to and and uh, have a little more open dialogue. That would be a lot of fun. Yeah. All right. Well, again, I want to make sure everybody realizes links are posted down below. You can find more information about Kate Vay and see some videos that she's made. And uh, we will tune in next time to buy the chalkboard. So thank you for tuning in. Thank you. Bye-bye. <laughs> Bye-bye.